Emily Whitmire, thank you so much for the time. Um, you're getting ready for your fight on March 7th at UFC 248, a big, big pay-per-view coming up. Uh, the first thing I wanted to get into is uh, you are a big proponent of cannabis. And recently, Elias, yes. he got a TUE in Canada. You know, when you heard this news, um, what was your reaction to everything? Um, Not a big reaction. I mean... I just think we're so outdated with it. I mean, MLB took it off their banned substance list. Uh, I guess hockey took it off theirs. And then now NFL is going to stop uh, punishing people for it, too. So I'm hoping that we're not going to be too far behind that. We don't have to try and get exemptions. I don't know if he's still signed with the UFC. or, um, But, I mean, if he has the exemption and he is, great for him. Uh, I need to call Jeff Nowinski and get one myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i just we're so outdated with it and it's i just don't really see how it's a performance enhancer i mean it maybe it helps us like sleep a little bit and that's like my biggest thing is just like when you get done with the really hard training day like it is so nice like just to have that little help to unwind your body and um i am fortunate enough to be sponsored and work for such an amazing company here they're 100 percent organic they don't use any pesticide or synthetic nutrients for the plants and i mean it really is truly medicine i mean it's the plant has so much medicinal use and so i'm hoping that maybe within the year that things will change i think a few fighters are starting to be more outspoken about their use and i think that the more fighters express their want for that to end i think the more the pressure will be on well at least maybe the fight after this you could fight in canada i think canada is the this the country that is allowing him to do that so Maybe in the next yeah. fight, you could fight in Canada and you could get your exemption. Yeah, I'm going to request it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, nine months between fights. It is a big gap. You know, why have you taken so much time off? So right after the fight, my hand was uh, injured during the training camp and then just pushed through and fought with it. And then I hadn't been home uh, totally in, to Oregon and Pacific Northwest area in total I had been home for three weeks and five years since I moved to Vegas and so I had this really big desire to get home and feel and then when I got back my hand just blew up. and so kept me out a little bit longer and so it was just kind of timing and sorry that's stinging it was just kind of timing wise and yeah, I got offered this fight in December. So that would have been, you know, technically like a six month layoff and then have been getting ready since then. So a little bit of injury, a little bit of, you know, just needing some time for myself. Um, I wasn't like super consistent, but I don't think people realize like the ultimate fire takes so much out of you. And then I fought in December and then I fought, I think it was like July and then had a little bit of a break and then fought in, uh, February and then June. And so it was just kind of like a lot all like stacked up. And so I think that was kind of why, but I, I didn't mind the time. Uh, I'm broke now, so definitely need to get going. <laughs> well, you've been very open about, you know, your fi financial issues, you know, when you're not fighting. And uh, how have you kept yourself afloat throughout this time? Um, so working with Green Life, they have been a huge help. Um, I really needed to get out of waiting tables. I don't think people understand how much energy that sucks out of your soul. I would go in and I just felt so kind of like ran down. It's just really in their pop ups where I go around all the dispensaries and collect the recycled jars back and then just kind of spread the good word about Green Life Productions. And it's been so awesome having that help because, I mean, especially when you lose a fight, you're not really making anything. It's maybe a little bit to help with bills, and that's kind of about it. So, that's unfortunate, but I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it helps, but uh, it's, it's just hard still. I just don't think people understand, like, how hard it is when you are on, like, the lower totem pole of the roster and you're not making that much money. Like, you really do have to have another job, and it's it's just so hard. I don't think under, people understand how hard it is to fight. And so, um, yeah, I just am really thankful that that's been helping to keep me afloat, but it's definitely time where I need to get in there. Yeah, definitely. A lot of people do not understand how hard it is. You know, regular people have a job and it's hard and they don't have to go train and they don't have to go through all the mental anguish and everything. And uh, I think fighters exactly. should be more open about what they go through uh, during camps or even outside of camps. I agree. I think a lot of people try and uh, like pretend like it's not. Mm -hmm. I, to me, like training's fun. Like, yes, it is 
exhausting physically, but it's, it's fun. I get to go to the gym. I get to see my friends. I get to, you know, work out and like, that's all fun. The hard part is when you're done with all of that. And then that's when the work starts, that's hard. And so like when I see people that have never had to work and had their parents drive them all over to the gyms and paid their way basically until they made it to the UFC and they're like, I've worked so hard to get here and I've had to do this. And it's like, "Mm -hmm." Not really. I don't think you quite understand what it's like to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been waiting tables since I was 16. So for the longest time, I was training twice a day. And then I'd go to work down on the strip from five till sometimes three in the morning and then start that all over again. I mean, I really was running my body into the ground. I I think that really did take away from a lot of my training. I think it was, you know, there was fights that I lost that I think I should have won, but I was working late nights. I was cutting weight and working late, which is harder because you shouldn't be eating late, but then you're out expending that energy and just the whole thing together. So I think the more that fighters, I don't want to say like talk about it more because we don't want to sound whiny and we don't want the UFC to think we're bitching. And so I think that it's kind of like a fine line, but, uh, it just sucks when you just, I mean, Instagram's like such a toxic thing now where like, it just is a direct link between you and sometimes not the greatest fans of the sport. And they just kind of shit all over you and you just trained all day and then you got to go to work and you get home, cook, clean, do laundry. I mean, and then you have some guy on Instagram telling you how much you suck. And it's like, wait a minute, (laughs) you have no idea what I just went through all day. Like, so it's, it's one of those things. It's, it, I mean, it comes with the territory. Don't get, I definitely had a little bit of a, a downtime where I was kind of like, I worked all these, all these hours, waited all these tables to get to this point, And then I'm still having to work. And it kind of made me a little sad. I was like, what the hell am I doing to my body? What am I doing to my soul and stuff? But I found my motivation again. So I, I'm hungry. Your last performance, it was last June, UFC, Minneapolis, didn't go as planned. Um, no, not when you at all. step back, right? You know, when you step back and look at the performance in retrospect, you know, what do you what do you take away from that and and what did you work on afterwards? Uh, I think it was mostly like the lack of performance. Um, I just kind of didn't have a very good camp and I think my coaches, they they just see me do so well in the gym and they just see so many awesome things that I've done that I may not even know that I'm capable of. And so they just had all this belief in me. And so like, it was just kind of Amanda hadn't fought in three years. So it's kind of hard to game plan as well, but they were just, you know, go out and do what you've been doing. And I'm like, ah, people are training to fight what I've been doing. Like there needs to be like some growth. And I feel like there was just some stuff that I didn't really get a fill in for that camp. And then I had this little bit of a, body change or something where I used to walk around a little bit heavier around like 137 and then I started walking around really light and it was kind of hard to keep weight on I was walking around like under 130 most of the time and then the night of the fight I was 123 so with everything on my clothes the gloves and it was just like I was just little most of the girls going in are around 130 and it just I was so excited to fight and I was so excited to get out there and like it's so easy to be like uh I didn't have any partners today, but that's okay. I still got my work in. Like I didn't, I did today wasn't the best training day, but that's okay. I still worked hard. And like, you can write all these things off, but you can only write them off so much before it kind of does turn into a big deal where you can write off one or two things, but when you're writing off 10, 20 things, I mean, that adds up in the end of camp. And so it just wasn't a good camp. Uh, wasn't a, wasn't a good performance. It just, that it, and I think that's kind of what hurts the most is when you lose and you know, you didn't perform to the best of your ability. I mean, I may have still lost the fight. Amanda is really good. I mean, she killed Mackenzie Dern after that. So it's like, she is really good. And so I may have still lost the fight, but I think I could have fought better you know, and so that that's a big heartbreak for your, any fighter, just knowing that it wasn't the best performance and it wasn't the best you. Yeah, it's, uh, that's what makes this uh, sport different than any other sport. You know, the consequences is, you know, you could go play basketball and, and lose a game and you could just go the next day and play basketball again. But fighting is not like that. Um, no. So that's why you got to respect the fighters to the fullest. Uh, now, your opponent, Pollyanna, she comes in here three fight losing streak it maybe with her job on the line you know do you go back and watch all three of those fights or do you let your coaches you know handle that uh, I actually watched them all I used to be somebody that didn't really like watching film but over time I I don't mind I like it and uh, I've watched all the fights uh sometimes I even go watch them if I'm just kind of maybe like 
having a weird day mentally, I go watch. I'm like, okay, no, this is like, I got this. And so, um, yeah, I've watched all the fights. I've watched them all a few times. Her coming off a three fight losing streak, I definitely think she's going to come out, you know, pretty hungry like myself. I mean, I'm only coming off one loss, but her record's a lot better than mine. So she has a little bit more flexibility there. And, um, so I think we both are coming out with a little bit of something to prove. Uh, I really like the matchup. I've wanted to fight her. She's been on my radar for a little while. Um, her only win was against Maya Stevenson, a girl I was on the ultimate fighter with. And, uh, Maya was so tiny. She walks around at like less than 125 pounds, like literally like 120. And, uh, I heard on the next, fight that Pollyanna fought that they were talking to her and I guess she was up to like 140 the day of the fight and I'm just like wow that was that was a big size difference you know and then if you watch her fights I think she does a good job like she'll get in the pocket she'll swing and she fights hard but she fades hard in the third round and you see that in a lot of her fights and I think uh my top pressure my wrestling style is going to be good because she's more of a jiu-jitsu player and so I think it's a good matchup. I think it's going to be a fun fight for the fans to watch. I can see why Mick wanted to make that matchup. Um, so I'm excited. I, I think it's going to be good. With your last fight, you know, the preparations wasn't the best. You said you didn't have the performance you wanted. You know, you go back, you know, did you make any changes in this camp or before you even went into this camp? Oh, yeah, a lot of changes. <laughs> so that's kind of been like a big thing like mm -hmm. this camp where I kind of took, reached out to a lot of people that I had met throughout my time here in Vegas that I had good relationships with and uh a lot of people that I had met through Robert Fallis and so uh Giff Jimmy Gifford um he is was Misha Tate one of my dear friends and one of my training partners the reason why I moved to Vegas um he was her coach you know all throughout her UFC career and she won a title with him and um he's been working with a lot of the guys down at Extreme Couture and he takes them all up to Red Rock and we all work out there so I'm really working out with all the same teammates that I've normally been just not really at Extreme and then uh Mark Dickman he's somebody that I have been wrestling with I used his wife Fanny um for a few of my camps when I fought Jamie Moyle and um she's so good she's great stand-up great jiu-jitsu great wrestling and he's really awesome himself and so i've been going over there and wrestling with them and working out and so and then i actually uh, started working out with some of the syndicate girls they were doing a lot of practices at the pi and me and roxanne are still very friendly we were on the ultimate fighter together and then joanne calderwood's there now so i've been able to really go with some high level girls and i think that's one thing um if you're fighting women, you have to train with women. We do different stuff that men don't. We move our hips differently. We just, we're so different. There's just things that we are able to do that guys don't really do. And so when I fought Amanda Rivas, I was sparring with one guy the whole time. He was really good. I was kind of, I lost every sparring round I had, which we should have definitely made that adjustment during sparring because the fight really kind of just went like, all my sparring went just like the fight did. It just was not good and like my coach was like don't worry like those elbows those knees they're gonna land they'll make differences in the actual fight and they just didn't really I mean she was just as big and strong as Corey the guy I was sparring and it was just yeah it just wasn't good and so I've really been trying to work with more women for this camp where I haven't really been using a lot of guys um and I think that is going to make a big difference yeah as as the sport grows there seems like they're the women the, the amount of women doing the sport and participating is so much more than it was even two years ago. And, and the teams are growing too. So it's great for you and anybody else, any woman out there that's uh, chasing a career and fighting. Now, um, in your division, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on the, the title fight coming up yes. that night, later that night. Uh, you got uh, Wei Lee versus Joanna. Wei Lee's going through all that like crazy coronavirus, traveling to Thailand, moving to Abu Dhabi, and now she's actually in Vegas getting ready. What do you think about this fight? Do you think Joanna, you know, it's going to be a striking matchup. So do you think Joanna yeah. has it? Like she can take it? Uh, it's it's hard to ever count uh, Joanna out. I mean, she is just so good. I mean, I actually sparred with her when she was getting ready to fight Carla, and I was still an amateur. I wasn't very good, and she broke my face and <laughs> totally beat me up. <clears throat> but 
Um, and I went to back to the gym and I told everybody, I was like, this girl is insane. Like she has the best stand up I've ever seen. And like, everyone was just like, shut up, Emily. And then now she's gone on and proved it. Um, but I do think Whaling has something special. I have watched her all of her fights since she's been in the UFC. And I feel like everyone kind of was always counting her out. And I mean, she beat a lot of really tough girls on her way up. And I, I do think that way I'm going to go with Wayling, but I am a little bit nervous that she's been dealing with all the coronavirus stuff and having to move her camps around. And like, that's stressful, but it seems like she has a good team of people around her that really support her. And that really makes things a lot easier when you have people helping you with your food and, you know, driving you around and taking you places like it does make things a lot easier. And sometimes when your camp's not perfect, it can help a, a lot, you know, like sometimes you're just like, like fuck it, I'm hungry, let's go. And I, I'm hoping that Wayling goes out and shows everybody. I really believe in her. All right. One last thing before I let you go. In combat sports, there are usually two types of individuals that compete. Uh, there's the martial artist and then there's the prize fighter. How would you describe yourself? I definitely think a prize fighter. Um, my road to get into fighting definitely wasn't through martial arts. I didn't start training gi or kickboxing and then transfer over. Um, I went to a bar one night and the announcers asked if anybody wanted to grapple. I didn't even know what grappling was or how to grapple. And I raised my hand and I got in there with somebody who was a pioneer of the sport, Lisa Ellis, and totally got beat up and looked awful and Somebody thought I looked tough, though, and came up to me after and was like, where do you train? I was like, I don't train. They're like, come to my gym. Started going to their gym like two days a week on my days off from working. Took a fight like two months later. Not a good idea. <laughs> but I just knew I wanted to do that. And so um, I don't think I was a, necessarily a prize fighter at the beginning. I was more of just a fighter. And now I think I'm more of a prize fighter. But definitely, I, I'm not a martial artist. I I I mean, I am in a sense just because I train everything and I, I respect the sport and I, uh, every sport that I train. Um, but I, I think I'm more of a fighter. I've been a fighter my whole life. I've always, you know, stuck up for what I believe in. I, you know, say what needs to be said, even if it's not, you know, the best thing to say. And, um, yeah, I definitely classify myself as just a fighter, not just a fighter, but a fighter. Awesome. Uh, March 7th, UFC 248, Las Vegas. You don't even have to travel. You're there already. Thank you, I know, Emily. It's so nice. <laughs> <It's spoiled. laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Emily, for the time and uh, good luck on the fight and good luck on all the other stuff that you're doing outside the cage. Uh, yes, hopefully we speak many more times in the future. Yes, yes. This was a great interview. You're awesome. <laughs>